Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to this workshop on working with public health policy, law and regulation. My name is Kylie Morfitt and I'm a research fellow at the University of Queensland and the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence on Achieving the Tobacco Endgame. Uh, before we begin, the Collaboration for Enhanced Research Impact acknowledges the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the lands where we live, learn and work. I'm located on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara peoples and acknowledge them as the traditional owners and custodians and pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants. Now, this symposium has been organised by early and mid-career researchers who are part of the Collaboration for Enhanced Research Impact, or CERI. Uh, we're a network of NHMRC-funded centres of research excellence focused on the field of preventive health. CERI is supported by the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre, and I'd really like to acknowledge the support of the Prevention Centre and also to thank their funding partners for their support of the symposium. Uh, just some notes on how the workshop will operate. Uh, we ask that you keep your mic muted and use the chat to communicate. Please feel free to use the chat to post any comments or questions. Uh, all speakers are going to present and then we'll save questions for the end, uh, but do type them in as you think of them and we'll try to get to them. Uh, we do have a resource list on the symposium platform for people who are interested in reading or exploring more. Um, also, just to let people know that there is a Prevention Centre Public Health Law Community of Practice that you can join, uh, just check the Prevention Centre website to get more information on that. So today we have three wonderful speakers who have backgrounds in law, research and policy. Uh, and first up, we'll have Dr Jenny Caldor. Jenny is Principal Policy Officer for the Tasmanian Department of Health and is a lawyer, policy analyst and researcher. She's previously worked for the World Health Organization in their public health law and ethics team and in private legal practice. And she's going to provide us with an overview of public health law. Thank you, Jenny, over to you. Thanks very much, Kylie. I'll just share my screen. Um, sorry, which we just practiced. <laughs> Sorry, Kylie. Um, sorry, I'm just having a, a, a uh, So if you have you clicked, oh, the, I've got it now. Yeah, I've got you it. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My apologies, everyone. Um, thank you, Kylie, for the introduction. And um, as Kylie said, I'm uh, joining you from public health services within the Department of Health in Tasmania. Um, but uh, in this presentation, I'm speaking on my own behalf and talking uh, to the research and policy background and overlap that I've had. Uh, I want to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Muanina people. Um, I'm presenting from Nipaluna Hobart. Um, I acknowledge with deep respect the Muanina people as the traditional owners of this land and stand for a future that profoundly, profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, including in public health and in law. So this, is, uh, this presentation is, was titled Public Health Law 101 and it's fair to say that we'll be, um, we'll be not doing a deep a dive on this particular topic, but rather an overview. I'm just struggling to get my slides to advance. Uh, here we go. No. Next slide. Sorry. I'm not sure what's happening. Apologies, everyone. Jenny, if you just hover over the slide. Yep. Um, is there a little arrow there in the bottom yep. left hand okay. corner? I've managed Wonderful. to move on. Sorry, the normal buttons are not working. Um, sorry, so, so let's jump into this Public Health Law 101. It's important to start out by acknowledging that public health law can mean different things to different people. And public health law is often defined by, uh, sometimes by definitions, but sometimes also by what it is not. Uh, for example, public health law is not medical law. Um, to borrow and maybe build on a phrase that was originally coined by Geoffrey Rose, 
who made the distinction between sick individuals and sick populations. Public health law uh, deals with the health of populations as opposed to medical or clinical law, which deals with the health or sickness of individuals. Other people conceptualise public health law as a set of tools or approaches, and I'll get more into that um, in a couple of slides' time. Uh, other people have distinguished public health law from public health policy with a degree of mandatoriness usually providing the divide dividing line between law and policy. And then still others would refer to those areas of public health practice that have a more uh, regulatory flavour about them. So we might think, for example, of tobacco control or food safety as falling within those categories. What these areas have in common is that, um, well, all these definitions and distinctions are correct, and what they all have in common is that they all refer to the actions of government in some way. And I've been working in and thinking about this area for more than 10 years, and it's only in putting together this presentation that I realised that when we talk about public health law, that's what those definitions really come down to. It's what can governments do, um, what powers and duties do they have? So just a quick, um, a quick scoop through the evolution of public health law over the last 100 plus years, because the other factor to take into account is that public health law is a moving target when we're trying to define it. Its modern origins lie in the Industrial Revolution, and there were you know, big public health acts enacted in Victorian England, which set the tone for many pieces of legislation that we still have today on the modern statute books. These, these pieces of legislation were initiated by social reformers who were interested in everything from food fraud to sanitation um, and infectious disease control, of course. In the early to mid 20th century, we saw a raft of new regulatory developments with massive implications for public health, thinking about food safety, uh, further infectious disease control, workplace health and safety, um, think about uh, the huge wins for population uh, mortality and, and morbidity through um, law, for example, seat belt, mandatory seatbelt interventions. In the 1980s, we saw the emergence of the new public health and increasing recognition of the social determinants of health. Um, and the role of law in managing that was became a, a more um, uh, topic of conversation leading into the 2000s about uh, the, the um, issues, more lifestyle issues or non-communicable diseases such as obesity being described as a new frontier in public health law. Possibly at that point, we thought that infectious diseases were a thing of the past, or at least that the role of law in dealing with them was no longer contentious. However, then of course, COVID came along, setting us right back to the origins of public health law with mandatory population-wide legal measures being a topic of extreme interest and discussion. So to the question of what is public health law, I'll firstly um, put up here the scholar's answer. I've sat on both sides of the fence from academia and policy. The scholarly answer, I've got two examples here from influential, um, I guess, theorists in this area, Goston from the US and Reynolds, who is Australian. Um, both talk about the legal powers and duties of the state to ensure the conditions for people to be healthy. Um, that's Goston's language. And then Reynolds' terminology is that law provides the powers and creates the structures that assist with the task of preventing disease and allowing the opportunity for longer and healthier lives. And these can seem, I think for people working in policy, these can sometimes seem a little bit abstract. So to the scholar's answer, I will also add perhaps the policymaker's answer, which um, links inextricably law with two other very important concepts, health policy and the notion of regulation. So in this regard, uh, this is the framework that I have often understood law to sit within, but many will disagree. And I would uh, be very interested if you've got questions or, or, um, or comments on this proposed framework. Um, I like to see law as sitting within policy, which sits within regulation. Um, regulation can be defined as per Julia Black from 2002, as the sustained and focused attempt to alter the behavior of others according to defined standards or purposes. And then drilling down further, policy is a more specific context, being a set of goals or plans or actions to achieve those goals. So we might think of something like the National Obesity Strategy as an example of um, a policy document. And then law is a subset of policy in this framing, whereby it's uh, perhaps a specific set of tools, perhaps those mandatory or binding implementation tools to help us achieve policy goals. So what are those tools? For those who see public health law as a set of tools or measures, this is often the framework adopted. Um, I've adapted Goston's framework and added onto it the work of Roger Magnuson. Um, 
if we have a look at these basic tools of public health law, so Gostin set out the power of the power to tax and spend, for example, um, through uh, say proposals for a sugar tax to Im improve public health nutrition. There's the power to alter the built environment, for example, through zoning laws and uh, to create maybe bike paths. The power to alter the informational environment, for example, banning advertising of particular products or regulating that advertising. There's the power to alter the socioeconomic environment, perhaps through subsidies of healthier or more desirable products or through the social wel welfare system. Uh, there is indirect regulation through tort law, which is perhaps less relevant in Australia with a slightly less litigious society, but we do see, for example, work, work health and safety concerns um, being dealt with in the courts and then having ramifications for public health. Um, a really interesting one is deregulation. So a tool of public health law might be to repeal a law which is having negative effects on health or undermining health. Um, when we amend or repeal a law, we can improve population health in certain um, sectors. So we can think about the decriminalisation of sex work in some jurisdictions as an example of deregulation for public health. So the one that I've added on from Magnuson is the internal regulation of government, which is the power of government to regulate itself. And one example there might be, for example, procurement standards in relation to the types of foods or products that government can uh, can buy. Um, so that is the what of the tools of public health law. And next, I want to give a quick overview of the how. Um, in her introduction, Kylie um, referenced the excellent knowledge synthesis, synthesis that our colleagues at the Prevention Centre put together um, last year. And I've got the reference down there below, and I commend this all as a document for everyone to have a look at. Um, so this is more about the how government might achieve some of those what goals. Um, noting the full range of regulatory tools at the disposal of policymakers, and you will see here that this list is not limited to the mandatory elements. Um, we've got legislation and regulation, but then we've also got things like voluntary co-regulatory approaches where a co-regulatory scheme might be overseen by government down to the more intra-organisational policies like the healthy food provision procurement types of directives that I mentioned earlier. You might want to consider this list in light of your own work um, and whether you've worked with any of these modalities and did you see yourself at the time as, did you understand that to be working with public health law and perhaps not because this is a reasonably broad definition of what, um, what would constitute public health law. Now we come to the why. Why would we use these legal tools in public health? The first answer is that legal and regulatory levers can affect whole of population. So remember Jeffrey Rose from my first slide and shifting the epidemic curve. For example, fluorid fluoridation of water or fortification of bread are small interventions that when made at the population level can have significant effects for the overall health of that population. A second reason as to why I use legal or regulatory tools is that often responsibility for the problem is collective and lies far outside the control of individuals. So even with all the personal responsibility in the world, there are many things that individuals would never be able to control. So think about the safety of drinking water, air quality, and many other environmental, as a broad, broadly understood term, hazards that might we, we might encounter in our daily lives, which affect our health, but that we are very rarely able to take control over. Another good reason is that for businesses, Law can often create the level playing field whereby all players need to abide by the same rules. So therefore you don't get a scenario where say big players in a market can use their market power or resources to either um, influence government or comply less. Um, everyone's subject to the same rules and needs to comply with, uh, with what has been stated. And then on a similar or a flip side of that for individuals, law can improve health equity and help to address the social determinants of health. For example, childhood vaccination schedules and their relationship to school entry or childcare entry. The tricky thing with the social determinants is that often those determinants lie far outside of the health sector. For example, in transport, education, food supply and so on, raising the interesting question of to what extent is this actually public health law, but that is a question for another time. One crucial aspect of working with law, policy and regulation in public health is because these are often mandatory interventions. Evidence is critical to establishing the case for them and uh, working them into the policy cycle. Evidence is so often crucial um, to whether, whether and how we use those legal interventions. And of course, everyone wants their interventions uh, implemented to be evidence-based. I've 
um, offered here a slightly cheeky list that I've taken from Lang and Heisman's book, Food Wars. Um, I wanted to include, because it's important to bear in mind that the relationship between policy and evidence is rarely straightforward. So sometimes we have uh, policy with evidence, sometimes we have policy claiming evidence, policy without evidence, evidence despite or in the face of policy and so, so on. And I do often come back to this example from Lang and Heisman just to emphasize that it's, it's no different to any other kind of law. Public health law is inherently political. And so while evidence is important, it is often not enough as we will see in other presentations today. That is not the only thing that's gonna get um, an a legal aspect um, implemented. Evidence can also mean a range of things in public health practice. In public health law, however, more often than not, we're not gonna get that one gold standard, that one clinical trial that shows the benefit of the intervention. More commonly, we're gonna be piecing together different feeds to form a chain of evidence. And this is an example um, of research that I conducted in South Africa for my PhD, um, where stakeholders explained to me that none of these pieces of evidence on their own would have been persuasive, but together they made a compelling case, not just for prevention, but for prevention through a legislative intervention. Um, so different types of studies together made up the compelling case. The final point I want to make about public health law is about the appropriate role and timing of using law in an overall policy cycle. Here is a widely used diagram of the policy cycle in Australia, and there are numerous points at which law may be up for discussion. The policy, anal the policy analysis itself may consider different legal options, and some of which may be legal and regulatory. Different policy instruments will consider the models that I presented earlier, for example, the what and the how of public health law. And then, of course, there's implementation. What happens after the law is passed or the regulation is made? How is it communicated out to the community? How is it enforced? And how is it taken up? These are all relevant considerations, which I know will be further unpacked by Tess and Janet in their presentations. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for the, um, the screen incompetence at the beginning. Oh, back to you, Kylie. Thanks, Jenny. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Professor Janet Hoke. Janet is a researcher at the University of Otago and co-director of the Aspire um, Aotearoa Research Centre, and she has served on many NGO and government advisory groups, both within New Zealand and internationally. Uh, she was a member of the Australian Government Expert Advisory Group that oversaw the introduction of plain packaging uh, and has been very involved in the Smoke-Free Aotearoa Action Plan, which she's going to tell us about today. Thanks, Janet. Thank you very much, Kylie. Um, great. So uh, with luck, you can all see my slides now. So uh, kia ora, thank you very much, Kylie, for asking me to be part of this uh, meeting today. Kylie's asked me to tell you a little bit about the Smoke-Free Aotearoa 2025 Action Plan. Um, just before I do, I want to acknowledge that I come from Ōtipoti, Dunedin in Aotearoa, and to acknowledge the Naitahu people um, who were the original settlers of the land from, from which I'm speaking. So just to give you a bit of a background about uh, my presentation, I've got a few key points here that I would like to cover. I'd like to first of all look at how our action plan arose um, and to consider whether or not it reflected public health policy success or whether it might instead be a response to ongoing failure of public health policy to secure appropriate outcomes for different population groups, particularly for Māori, the Indigenous people of Aotearoa. Then I'd like to look at the shift in focus that's occurred with the introduction of our action plan. And as I'll explain, what we've seen is a, a very powerful movement from incremental measures through to an approach that's really focused now on structural change. Um, obviously, making that movement has required a lot of political support. And Kylie has also asked me to tell you a little bit about what works with politicians. I, I wish I really knew the answer to that question but I'll uh, certainly share some of the things that we found um, seemed to, to elicit some responsiveness from them. And then finally, I'd like to look at whether and how we've managed this integration of ethics and regulation, policy and law um, that Jenny has been talking about 
So first of all, just to give a little bit of background, Aotearoa was originally what Māori call a tūpika kore nation. So what that means is that we were a tobacco-free country. There was no use of tobacco in any kind of ceremonial practices. Uh, tobacco was uh, introduced by colonisation and in these amazing paintings of Māori kuia or women who were elders in their iwi or tribe, you can see how fully uh, smoke tobacco use has become integrated into everyday life and practices and both are featured here with the pipes. So tobacco was introduced typically via trading as uh, part of the exchange for land during colonisation. But since then, tobacco use has become widespread among Māori and uh, today uh, and for a very long time, tobacco use has imposed a disproportionate burden on Māori. And just to show you what that looks like, you can see in this graph here, evidence of smoking prevalence, what we call current smoking prevalence, that means smoking that's occurred uh, on at least a monthly basis. So 10 years ago, you can see that smoking prevalence among Māori shown in this blue line was around 40%. Now, over that 10 year period, we can see that it has roughly halved, which of course is a very good thing. But what's not so encouraging is the fact that inequities in smoking prevalence have remained. And we've uh, closed at the absolute gap a little bit. So the difference between prevalence among Māori and among European, which you can see in the purple line, is no longer as great in an absolute sense. But in a relative sense, we still have around two and a half times as many Māori smoking as we have non-Māori. And that, of course, is a huge concern. And it's evidence that the approach that we've taken to date simply hasn't worked as well for Māori as it has for non-Māori, and we need to be doing things differently. So uh, that, that was certainly a concern that many Māori politicians and health researchers and activists held. They recognised this disproportionate burden. They saw that it had persisted over an extended period of time. And they frankly said that they were fed up with the way in which current policy had simply not done enough to address that. So they were the ones who proposed the tobacco endgame vision, the Tupika Kore vision, um, which reflects the fact that Aotearoa was initially a tobacco-free nation. And I'd like to acknowledge Shane Bradbrook, um, who led Te Reo Marama, which was the Māori smoke-free uh, coalition. Hone Harawera, who was absolutely pivotal in the parliamentary inquiry that was undertaken by the Māori Affairs Select Committee, and I'll explain a little bit more about what they did shortly. And also Dame Tariana Churia, who was the Associate Minister of Health with responsibility for tobacco products, and who did an enormous amount to ensure that where there was an opportunity, it was taken and new measures were introduced. So just to tell you a little more about the Māori Affairs, uh, Affairs Select Committee inquiry, uh, this was an extremely wide-ranging inquiry, as you can see from the title. It explored tobacco use and the consequences for Māori. The members of the Select Committee travelled throughout Aotearoa. You can see here Hone Harawera at a hearing. What he's holding in the plastic bag is the diseased heart of someone who came along to make a submission. So this person, obviously a, a, a heart transplant recipient, had brought along his old heart uh, to share with the committee members the disease that he had experienced as a consequence of smoking. So the committee heard many very powerful stories like that. It also held the tobacco industry to account. And here what you can see is one of those uh, a possum in the headlight moments where Hone Harawera had just asked a particularly probing question of the tobacco industry executive. And you can see he is um, somewhat speechless in being able to respond to that. The committee wrote a report, which is what you can see in the left hand image. The government always has to respond to that, and they did. And they responded with two key. Um, outcomes and they agreed with reducing smoking prevalence 
uh, to minimal levels, which is widely defined as below 5% and as close to zero as possible. And they also agreed with reducing tobacco availability and making Aotearoa essentially smoke-free by 2025. So as I said, where did the impetus come from? Um, it really came from Indigenous politicians and health advocates. Could we regard it as a natural progression from the existing approaches? Actually, it proposed a radically different approach. And really what that approach did was to recognize these sustained failures of the business as usual approaches that we had followed here for so long. So this shift in focus uh, really um, focused very much on the government's intention to achieve a close to zero smoking prevalence. And what that did was to reject the status quo, the business as usual approach that I've explained and shown you uh, in the graph that I, I presented earlier, how it simply resulted in a gradual decline in prevalence. And that was largely a result of incremental policy advances rather than any kind of sustained strategy. So. What we needed, it was recognised, were completely novel solutions to address a, a situation that had been unacceptable for decades and to do so sooner rather than later. So that's what the uh, the goal and, um, and the Smoke Free 2025 vision really set out. What actually happened in practice? Well, what happened in practice was that we had to learn a lot of patience because not a lot happened. Um, and certainly from the goals announcement in 2011 uh, through the following decade, very little happened by way of development of a, an action plan or any sort of sustained strategy. So what we did then was to continue to develop research evidence and support the serendipitous policy opportunities that arose. So removal of tobacco retail displays, the introduction of plain packaging, extended excise tax increases, those sorts of measures. And I guess um, perhaps more by chance than by design, we also learned a little bit more about what politicians saw as being priorities. And I guess one of the things that we learned was that while numbers seem very compelling to us, um, they are elected by people and they are always mindful of that and place a high priority on people's voices. So evidence like this uh, that we presented uh, shows um, the odds ratio of smoking experimentation among young people according to the frequency with which they visit convenience outlets. And to me, even though these are crude odds ratios, they show a really clear dose-response relationship. So in other words, more frequently young people go into convenience stores, the greater the risk that they will be experimenting with smoking. So when we have a dose-response relationship like this, the obvious thing if we want to reduce harm is to reduce the dose but this was not an argument that it, it was easy to convince politicians about instead they were much more interested in people's voices and adults voices and here are some of the, the quotes from some qualitative work that we also presented to them be a hell of a lot easier if it, were, if it wasn't there the displays weren't there because they represent temptation even as someone who smokes, I'd say, yes, I'd like to see them gone because one day I might give up and then I won't need to see them. And this idea of temptation was important. If it's in your face, you're really struggling, then removing it from sight would make things easier. And at this time, Helen Clark was prime minister and this person said, if Helen would take them away, I'd be so happy. Not being able to access them would be the biggest thing. So uh, we learned that voices like this really resonated with politicians. So to, to get back, even though the outcome from the vision was very clear, we simply didn't have a plan. We had limited action, and that limited action occurred across successive governments of different political persuasion. And so, of course, the very slow declines in smoking prevalence continued. Um, and this ad hoc policy approach, uh, while it allowed us to introduce some important measures, it really lacked a strategic focus and it certainly wasn't designed to achieve the end game goal. But in 2020, we had a, a major turning point, and that was when we had a new minister appointed, Dr. Aisha Vero, and she had responsibility for tobacco. So just over a year after her appointment, the action plan was released. 
And less than a year later, at the end of last year, our Smoke Free Environments and Regulated Products Amendment Bill came into effect and was passed. So really quick action. The focus of uh, the new legislation is directly on the inequities in smoking prevalence. So it's designed to do something about the burden that's placed on Māori and, and to a lesser extent on Pacific peoples. And it recognises that actually we cannot call realisation of the goal of success until that goal is recognised in all communities. It also has a focus on ensuring our tamariki and rangatahi, our children and young people remain smoke free. So it's focused on helping them to live in smoke free settings and supporting those around them to become smoke free to quit. And so it wants to increase the number of people who quit smoking successfully. And here the focus is on changing the environment to make it easier for people who smoke to quit. The action plan that was produced has six focus areas. Three of those are non-legislative and three are legislative. And these were uh, the measures that, that were included in the legislation that was passed at the end of last year. We also have a timeline. I appreciate that's a little bit difficult to see. I just want to point out that the three core measures in our legislation, the retail reduction policy, the first one will come into effect in just under a year. The denicotinization policy will follow nine months later. And then at the beginning of 2027, the impact of our smoke-free generation policy will also become apparent. So how did we integrate these um, ideas of, of policy, regulation and law that Jenny talked about? I guess the uniting uh, concern that's, uh, that supported the approach taken has been this concern over sustained inequities. I think that not only stimulated our smoke-free goal, it still continues to lead it. This recognition that the ongoing delays in reducing prevalence are completely unacceptable. Māori champions now not only lead the change that we're seeing, they've also been given the power to oversee that change and ensure that the focus on inequities doesn't get diluted. But there are challenges that remain. We still need to implement the measures. We still need to monitor the implementation process. And of course, we need to evaluate whether the outcomes, that are the, the goals that drove the process are in fact realised. We know that the industry is already active in trying to undermine these measures. So we are hoping that perhaps uh, the next time you have a, a meeting like this, we might be able to come along, explain how we've managed to deal with the threat that they present, and also share some data about how the outcomes, the goals that have been set, have in fact been realised. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to meet with you. Um, I hope that there's something in my presentation that's useful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. That was a really fantastic presentation on, on what's happening and how you got there. I'm going to hand over now to Tess Rooney. So Tess is currently doing her PhD um, at the CRE on Achieving the Tobacco Endgame. She's researching the interactions between public health and law. Prior to starting her PhD, Tess was a Commonwealth public servant who led large-scale public sector pro, uh, projects, including developing legislation and regulatory frameworks. And she's going to provide some practical tips uh, for influencing policy and regulation. Thanks, yeah. Tess. I'm just sharing my screen, hopefully. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, Sorry, Tess. Um, we're just we can see your um, notes as well. So okay, if Let's you just there we go. Does wonderful. that work? Yeah, yep. that's great. Thank you. Okay, so as as Carly said, my name is Tess Rooney. Um, I would like to acknowledge again the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet. I'd like to pick up on something that Jenny said. Policy making in practice is inherently political. It is always political. I've worked as an advisor. I've worked in drafting legislation. I've worked in um, parliament for longer than I care to remember. What I wanted to sort of talk about was some very practical tips around how to get your minister or your MP involved, how to get a submission through, how to get a policy brief through. Um, 
Janet talked about what do politicians care about. Politicians care a lot about an interest group's endorsement. They care about a personal story. They care about qualitative stories, local press and editorials. Fundamentally, they want to get re-elected and we have incredibly short election cycles in Australia. That doesn't mean that they don't care about real issues or public health issues. Most politicians are, are incredibly committed, hardworking people, but they fundamentally need to get re-elected so that they can in, in, in um, to continue that work happening. They care about concrete asks that entail a verifiable action. As public health professionals, we often have global goals or global um, evidence. From a politician, they need a very specific, measurable goal that they can put into legislation or into recommendation and then tick a box that says, I've done this. I've done this thing. It can go in my newsletter. It can go in my media. I have done a thing. And the more effort that they put in, that they see from advocates, the more they will care. Um, form letters, a tweet, a Facebook comment is not as effective from, from our point, of, from our side, um, as continual meetings and local engagement for, for it with your local MP. And that doesn't matter whether it's a minister or it's a local MP, they're all local MPs at the end of the day when it comes to re-election. From an advisor's point of view, a good policy brief is short. It's two or three pages. If I'm lucky, I may get half an hour, 20 minutes with my minister every day. So I need to be able to, to, to distill down what is come, what is there um, to get it in front of them. It contains one issue um, and has charts. Politicians really like charts. They really like graphs. They really like pie charts. They really like things that are clear and easy and that they can read on a plane. I don't need to know what the evidence is. I need to know that you are a credible person and that you know what the evidence is that you have the numbers and that you can uh, and that you can recite them if asked but i don't need to know that i also need to know why the current policy is inadequate why we would do something so janet talked about the business as usual just wasn't working that's a really good start for, from an advisor's point of view if we're going to do something dramatically different we need to know why the current situation is not working um, and it needs to be practical. The best policy briefs that we see will also articulate who's going to be affected because who's going to be affected is who's going to be screaming at me tomorrow. Um, Janet's laughing, but it's true. It, it, I need to know who, which relationships I'm going to manage and where I'm going to manage them because that's the first thing my minister is going to ask. When I'm looking at a policy or when I'm meeting with a public health advocate, the questions I'm asking myself is, can I draft this? How am I going to draft this? How is this legislation or regulation actually going to play out on the page? Is it going to be um, easy for me to do that? Is it going to be fussy drafting? Am I going to need to put into place legislation that is going to have to shift. Uh, and we use the example here of, of tobacco control. We had every piece of legislation under the sun talked about tobacco. Suddenly we have vaping, we have e-cigarettes, and we have to change all of that legislation to have other like products. I need to know that it's credible that it's a credible, that you've built a coalition or that you've built um, evidence that is, that, is, that is credible in the public domain. That when my minister goes out there and stands in front of a doorstop and he says, the Cancer Council is behind this or um, the anti-gambling people are behind this, 
or Smoke Free Atarara is behind this, then I have a coalition that I that, that is supporting me. And I need to be able to know how I'm going to defend it to the centrals. So health, public health, health ministries, we're going to have to stand up in front of Treasury and say, can we have some money, please? And we'd like a lot of money to do things with. And they're going to say no. So how am I going to defend this policy between all of the different central organisations to get my, my policy through Cabinet? And the more information you can have in there about how that's going to work, the better off you're going to be. When it comes to trading with the other side, and it doesn't matter whether that's Liberal or Labor or the crossbench or independence, how am I going to defend this policy? And what are my allies? Because nobody wants to be on the floor of Parliament by themselves. The more coalitions we can get, the better off we're going to be. In terms of submissions, one of the things that we really notice is and, and I know this is a very sort of fussy screen, but I've, I've tried to actually bring out some submissions, some some really practical submissions that work in terms of actionable recommendations. So we we will run an inquiry. We will get a thousand submissions in place. We will create a spreadsheet, and most of those spreadsheets are yes or no's. Do you have evidence to support this? Yes, no. We we don't put it in there. What we need to do, what we want to do is get actionable recommendations in there. So when I see in a statement in a submission that say options include, reframe that. Um, these are all actual submissions I've seen in, in terms of, of some work I was doing for the NDIS. Um, but what choice do you want me to make? What exactly is the right choice? If if you're giving me four options. I, it, it becomes problematic to, to, to meet my time frames. Yeah. Um, Professor X wrote in a paper that funding for the NDIS is the lowest in the there's international grouping. Okay. But what does this research actually mean for my plan? Increase your funding. That's what you're looking for. Say that, make it as actionable as possible. Um, same as grab quotes. Again, Janet uh, talked about personal stories. Committee writers, we really like quotes that we can just pick out and put into the report. Um, simple three or four sentences that, that look impressive. It makes our job a lot easier. So a good submission clearly addresses the terms of reference and we'll have the terms of reference articulated up the top. Establish your credit, your organization's credibility or your own credibility. I've been researching in this space for 14 years. I've been doing this work um, because again, that gets you into that space of people I'm going to that 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 are going to be meaningful. It's concise. Um, again, no longer than four or five pages. The committee will always come back to you and, and ask you to give further evidence if they need it. It emphasizes your, your key points um, and outlines not only what the issues are, but also what problem, but how the problems can be addressed. Because the committee will be looking to make for ideas to make recommendations. So again, actionable plans that are deliverable work really well. And I thought that was going to take longer to say. <laughs> Thank you, Tess. That's great. Um, really practical tips. And also just to say that that resource list that is on the Crowdcoms platform has um, some other really practical um, guidelines for doing policy submissions and policy briefs as well, including one by the Prevention Centre. Um, so we do have time for questions now. Um, so I'll start with um, someone who's asked, what if the issue is not in numbers? 
Politicians also need to think beyond charts and numbers alone and how can we change that mentality and work with them to change their minds when evidence is qualitative? Mm. Who wants to start? Janet? Sorry, I'm just having a quick look at um, it, it, the question. I mean, one um, strategy that I think has, has worked very well here in Aotearoa is to try and elevate young people's voices. Um, and certainly our politicians have given them a, a very good audience. So we've had groups of young people who have gone along. Their presentations have been much more about vaping than they have been about use of smoked tobacco products. Um, but they have reported on their own lived experiences, what they observe among their peers, what's happening within their schools and also in their wider communities. And I think um, politicians have, I, I think just recognise the authenticity of young people's voices. They don't have an agenda other than, other than concern for their peers. So I think that more qualitative evidence um, has been quite powerful. Um, when... I guess our, our approach is, has also been along the lines that that Jenny suggested in that lovely example of the um, of the salt that you worked on for your PhD. We uh, we need to recognise that sometimes we've got to present a range of different evidence and so that might mean the lived experience of people it might mean the epidemiological population level evidence it might mean modelling evidence and certainly for our end game policy. Um, where we don't have evaluations to draw on, we were certainly trying to present a very diverse evidence base and that seems to, to have worked with, at least with our Minister of Health, who is a former academic and kind of understands what research evidence is all about. Yes, or Jenny, do you have anything to add, Jenny? Yeah, thank you, Janet and Kylie. The other thing I would add to that is making the compelling point about what a different piece of evidence is actually demonstrating, because so often those of us who may be used to working in qualitative research, we, we know what we're looking for, we know the methodology, but then the outputs of that evidence, it's not automatically clear what point it's making. So are we making the point that salt consumption is high, or are we making the point that intervention would be valuable, or are we making the point that intervention should be in the way of a law? Those are three very different points and can be made using different kinds of evidence. So translating what a piece of evidence shows to be user-friendly to, as Tess said, be a very actionable outcome, I think is really critical when we're working with qualitative evidence and people who might prefer quantitative data. Thank you. All I'd add to that is that politicians love qualitative evidence. It's a story. It's a it's a it's the words it's the narrative um it, it it's an easy sell if you think about any of the the really big public campaigns um the mesh law you know the 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 mesh campaigns the um robo debt that they're all led by people and if you can get into your local mp or into your policy you, you, your your state or federal local MP and you have a story and you have a face of that story, then that becomes really powerful in terms of having a champion. Thank you. I have a question about how to actually get the policy briefs to the politicians, Tess. <laughs> like you might write one, how do you know that they get it and they get it at the right time and that they're going to read it when there's so many other um, people competing for their interests? Uh, <laughs> you hassle their advisors. Um, again, working locally is really productive. Working with the politicians when they're in, like your, your MP, even your minister, you know, even a minister or a cabinet minister spends an awful lot of time in their electorate. And that's when they have capacity to meet with people and they have capacity to go to morning teas and to organise their focus groups and to be invited to the opening of your centre or to be invited for a tour for your centre with the, with the media standing outside being local in their environment. So it's not necessarily a formal meeting. This is what I was saying about the more work you put into that relationship, 
the more success you're going to have in getting that relationship across the line. If I, if a, a an MP knows that they're going to get a local endorsement from an organization because they've got that relationship, then they're much more likely to, to read your brief. Um, and the brief is the, the final point of that. Hopefully by the time that we're getting that brief, um, we already know that that you're credible. We already know what you need. We already know that you what you want. And the brief is the the actionable. Do do this. Um, and it really should be that simple. Jenna or Jenny, do you have anything to add about how to get the attention of politicians? I've never worked on that side of the fence, so <laughs> um, I, I guess I would. The only comment I would make was in the the, the South African research that I did on salt. Um, when we're talking about champions, there was strong evidence that this, the evidence had been communicated to policymakers and to champions over a long period of time. And I've heard this same story from numerous public health advocates and researchers and, and policymakers. The same evidence had been communicated over time but it took the right person with the right motivation to actually hear that evidence and to do something about it. So it happened that there was, in that case, um, a big international meeting coming up and South Africa wanted to show leadership at this meeting. And so it was timely. And so the dogged repetition of that evidence by those researchers finally reached the receptive ears of the policymaker who then also wanted to have an important um, a, a legacy, I suppose. And so it, maybe there was nothing that they could have done other than to pick the right, you know, we talk about policy windows opening, the window had to open and then they were ready to rush through when they were, <laughs> when they saw that chance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would certainly agree with that. I, I think for us, you know, we saw a, a, that 10 year period where there really, we, we had a goal, but we just didn't have any action that was specifically dedicated to supporting that goal and it was only when we had a new minister who as I said understood research evidence had cared for people who were dying of illnesses caused by smoking that we got the kind of political momentum so um, she was very receptive to evidence that had accumulated but if it had been someone different I don't know if we would have had that. Excellent another question um, could the speakers comment on the role of framing for example when a health crate health frame could be coupled with economic or other frames? I'm, I'm going to leap in here because this is sort of where my research is currently heading. Um, one of the things that we see a lot is that public health and public health law advocates stay in the health lane. And one of the most successful examples of this is a um, submission that was done by the Victorian Cancer Council into the casino inquiry in, in Victoria. So there's a range of regulatory spaces, corruption, all sorts of other things. And the Victorian Health, uh, Victorian Ca Cancer Council put in a submission that said, we don't care about that. What we care about is the fact is that the um, high roller room still allows smoking. It's the one place in, in, um, in Victoria where smoking is still permitted inside. Could you just not do that? And that was one of the recommendations that was picked up. It was actionable, it was easy, and it was non-controversial within the space of that inquiry, which was talking about licensing and a whole range of other engagements. So definitely be, be reframing health in terms of economic senses, but putting the health message, public health message into the, those economic forums is really important uh, and it's really important in counteracting the economic messages that are brought forward by, well, in, in my case, in the tobacco industry and their allies. Um, and, and, and some of the success in Atarara is that you really see that, is that health, health submissions started playing in that retail reduction space and, and, the, and they got this, this amazing law across the board. I think one of the things that we've looked at is um, 
the arguments that the tobacco industry put out. So we think about the framings that they are using and then um, make sure that we respond to those and undermine and address the arguments that they are trying to communicate. What we often find is that they will focus very much on economic arguments. So they will be looking at things like illicit trade, um, economic uh, downturn, um, disadvantage to small retailers, which of course is a particularly sensitive topic in a post-COVID environment. So we try and make sure that we've developed evidence so that we're able to counter those arguments. And I, I've just seen the, the comment about um, whether we have any thoughts on the right to health as a frame. And I think that that was especially important in our smoke-free generation policy because that is not a policy that is going to bring about a rapid reduction in smoking prevalence, certainly not in the way that denicotinization is modelled to do. But it explicitly asserts that young people have a right to a smoke-free life, and it, it recognises, and I think very cleverly, goes beyond age restrictions by making it clear that there is actually never a safe age at which people can start smoking. And I think that right to health that's embedded in the smoke-free generation policy has been a really important one. Jenny, do you have anything to add to that? Thank you. Uh, just conscious of time, but the only thing I would add is in any question of framing, you know, whether it's an economic land, or whether it's the health um, with the right to health kind of lens, I would say, you know, now that I'm on this side of the fence working in policy, I would say just be cognizant of who your audience is. And if your audience is not going to be receptive to that human rights lens, then try a different lens. If, if your audience is going to, you know, bristle at uh, talk of the social determinants, you know, have that woven in and use that evidence, but frame it up um, in language that will be understood because there is no point to, um, uh, to, you know, right, no, not there's no point. There can often be uh, ways of framing things that will be more well understood um, to different audiences. And I think we, we have the role to sometimes open those windows of opportunity and sometimes to respond to them. And, and it's about recognizing, you know, whether the framings, whether the framing is one that will just be not understood or whether it's about, um, you know, cre creating that opportunity. Okay, um, we're approaching the end now, so I think we'll finish up there. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers so much and everyone who attended uh, and who's also attended uh, the rest of the symposium events. This is the last one. So I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And remember, there is an evaluation um, to do if you haven't done that already. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kylie. Yeah, thank you, Kylie. Thanks, everyone. Happy Bye, everyone.